Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for stopping by. I'm really glad you're here. My name is Becca and this channel is all about my love for spinning, knitting, weaving, sewing, all the fiber things. I invite you to grab whatever project you have on the go and join me. Let's make some stuff. Today I'd like to talk about how I got into spinning. We'll talk about how I learned uh, the tools that I used when I first started and some of the things that I learned along the way that really changed the way I spin and the way I think about spinning. So about 12 years ago I um, was living in the UK and I visited a friend of mine who was a living history interpreter at a woolen mill near Liverpool and she was very kind and sort of gave me the um, backstage tour, as it were. And there were some other living history interpreters there who were spinning on flax wheels. And they graciously gave me a go. And although I definitely wouldn't have been hired by the mill, I wasn't any good, uh, being my first time ever touching a wheel. Uh, it was fun. And it really struck something deep within me that made me want to learn more. Well, then I moved back to the United States and I sort of forgot about it for a couple of years. And the way that I got into spinning was a bit of a strange path. So about 12 years ago, again, 10 years ago, time escapes me. I was very into going to thrift stores and I really wanted to try my hand at recycling some thrifted sweaters into yarn that I could knit with because I was looking for ways to enjoy my knitting hobby that would be more cost effective. Um, so not having to go out to the shop and buy yarn. And at this point I really hadn't thought much about how yarn was made. Um, just that it was made into things. So I was looking for thrifted sweaters that would meet um, some criteria that I had in my head that would make them good for recycling. The first was that it should be a very large sweater so that there would be a lot of yarn in it uh, to be able to make a garment for myself. The second was that um, it should be made of a fiber that I wanted to spin with, or so, excuse me, that I wanted to knit with. So 100% wool, 100% cotton, these were the kinds of sweaters that I was looking for. And then I realized that I needed to check the seams and make sure that the seams were sewn and not surged. And this is really important if you're thinking about doing, um, doing this, recycling sweaters. If it's got surged seams, that means that the in the seaming process, the yarn has been cut. And if you try to unravel that, you'll end up with a bunch of short pieces of yarn from each row that you really can't do anything with. So a large sweater with lots of yarn in it, uh, sewn seams, not surged, and of a fiber content that I wanted to knit with. And so as I was looking around, I found a couple of sweaters that fit this description. I found a, I was looking in the um, section with the menswear so that I could find an extra or extra, extra large men's sweater so I could be sure to have a lot of yarn. And I found a wool, 100% wool double knit sweater, which was perfect because that's twice as much yarn. Um, in my estimation of uh, compared to a just a single knit sweater. So that was the first one. The second one was a hundred percent cotton sweater, which was sort of a chunky worsted or heavier worsted weight cotton yarn. So I bought the sweaters and I took them home and I started unraveling them and the wool sweater went okay. Um, it was, the yarn was very uh, textured 
from where it had been in the uh, knit pattern for so long. So it was not straight yarn, it was wavy yarn, but I just went ahead with that. The cotton, on the other hand, did not go so well. And as I was unraveling it, the yarn untwisted as well. And so this yarn was, as I said, it was a worsted weight, heavy worsted weight yarn, but it was made up of six individual strands of cotton. And so what I ended up with was not so much cotton yarn as six parallel uh, threads of cotton thread. And I thought, well, I need to put the twist back in this. How do I do that? And apparently I had completely um, forgotten my trip to the woolen mill in Liverpool because I was trying to think about how I could attach one into this door handle on the other side of the room and I could stand on one side and maybe twist it in, in uh, short batches and that didn't really seem to work. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but then eventually I, I, eventually I uh, called in a friend who knew a little bit about spinning and thought, well, they'll be able to tell me how to do this. And of course their answer was, well, you have to spin it. <sighs> right. Of course you do. Well, how do I do that? At this point, I didn't have any tools for spinning. I didn't know what I was doing at all. So I went on the internet, as you do, and found some do-it-yourself, how to make your own spindles for spinning yarn out of things that you find at the craft store. So the things that I, I went out to the craft store and bought were wooden dowels, wooden toy car wheels, glue, and cup hooks. And this is what we turned up with. These are my very first spindles that I used. Uh, they are, again, a dowel cut to a certain length with car, uh, toy car wheels, cup hooks on the end. They're glued together. Um, I couldn't decide. I didn't know anything about this, so I couldn't decide whether I wanted a top whirl or a bottom whirl. So I made one of both, one of each. Um, and this is what I used to plot, reply, I learned later that was the term for it, reply the yarn that I had unraveled from the cotton sweater. And this is the respun yarn. As you can see, it's um, multiple threads. I over twisted it so it's very, um, has a lot of energy in it and wants to spin back on itself. But I used these tools to redo uh, this yarn. And so success, I suppose. I was able to then knit a pieces of a sweater, which are here. These are, obviously I never finished it, um, but combining the blue of the, the yarn that I unraveled, I think it turned out pretty well. It would have if I'd ever finished it. Um, it's combined with 100% uh, cotton um, dish cloth yarn that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. So I'll put that down in the description um, if you're interested. But um, yeah, why didn't I finish it? I don't know. I wasn't very happy with how it was turning out, I guess. Um, didn't know what to do with the sleeves and Honestly, I didn't have quite enough yarn because this sweater wasn't nearly as big as the wool one. The wool sweater, on the other hand, was very successful. This yarn also untwisted a bit, but it was not nearly as bad and it's as the cotton. Um, so I went ahead and just used it as it was. Uh, it was mostly this tan color, mostly this tan color, 
but also had some green. I think it was in the yoke. This was a long time ago when I bought this sweater, so I don't really remember what it looked like. But I think there was a green banding across the yoke. And for those of you eagle-eyed viewers who might notice that this sweater that I'm wearing was actually made from this recycled yarn. Um, it doesn't fit me quite as well as it did 10 years ago, uh, but it still is uh, very comfortable. And because it was double knitting, I got a ton of yarn, so I have lots left over. And I also made a skirt with a Fair Isle border. This skirt was a, I enjoyed making the, the skirt, but I've never actually worn it because I don't like what it looks like on me. And I think that's just because I don't really like knit skirts. I've not made another one. So lots of yarn from this one double knit sweater. So recycling sweaters is a great thing, but you have to look for those things that I mentioned um, before, especially the surged seams because otherwise you'll just end up with a mess of short pieces of yarn that you can't do anything with. The sweater, the sweater that I'm wearing, um, again, comes from another pattern book. If you watched my last video, you'll know I love a pattern book. This is from Elspeth Lavold's uh, Viking Patterns for Knitting. This particular sweater is actually the one that's on the cover. Um, mine turned out a little bit uh, more fitted rather than loose. Should have marked the page before I came on video. This pattern is the Hervor, which I'm probably pronouncing terribly, Hervor pullover and cap, which I didn't make the cap, but this is the pullover, from Viking Patterns for Knitting by Elspeth Leveled. So after that recycling project, I wanted to see if I could try my hand at making yarn from scratch using these spindles. And so I made a couple of small projects and my husband noticed that I was becoming interested in this. And um, I'm very lucky. He really likes to encourage my crafting and my hobbies. Um, and so unbeknownst to me, he went out and researched the best spinning wheels for beginners and bought me the Ashford Kiwi 2 at the time, this was in 2010, from the Woolery, which if you aren't familiar with the Woolery, it is a fantastic shop and resource uh, for spinners and weavers and knitters. Uh, they have a brick and mortar shop in Kentucky but they also have a huge online store, which I absolutely love. Um, and their customer service is fantastic. So shout out to the Woolery. Thank you so much for helping my crafting journey. The, I'll show you my wheel up close, but the Ashford Kiwi 2 is a double treadle, castle style wheel with scotch tension. Thanks, dog. The Ashford Kiwi 2 is a double treadle castle style wheel with scotch tension that um, is very, very, in my experience, very easy to spin with. Um, I still love it. I still use it. And in 2010, it was the Ashford Kiwi 2, but they now have a new version called the Ashford Kiwi 3 which is very similar to the Kiwi 2, but the differences I think are mainly in the bobbin size is different and the uh, flyer assembly is different. I'm sure there are some other differences as well, but um, they look fairly similar to one another. Uh, I haven't spun on a Kiwi 3, so I can't really speak to the differences between them too, too much. Um, but the Kiwi 2, uh, again, very beginner friendly. Um, 
all spinning wheels are expensive, but the the Ashford Kiwi I think is on the um, more affordable end compared to some other brands and models of wheels. But that's my wheel. I, again, I'll show you up close uh, the wheel and some spinning action using that wheel as well as the spindles. But that was my first spinning wheel.
Next, I'd like to share with you some of the things that I learned along the way and where I learned them, which I feel turned me from a person who uses a spindle and has a spinning wheel into a real spinner. And the, the way that I learned to spin, I didn't have anybody around me who was a spinner, so I didn't really have that one-on-one, -on -one, somebody teaching me how to spin. I mostly learned, I would say, from books and from written instructions on on the internet. Um, again, a little early for all the YouTube content that's out there now. For all of you just learning how to spin, you have a lot more resource at your fingertips than I did. Um, but mostly I just spun a lot and uh, practiced a lot and, and figured some things out. But then I also used, I know this is going to age me, DVDs, which I still have, um, and one in particular, which was called From Wool to Walking with Norman Kennedy. There is a preview of this on YouTube. You can't get the whole video, but there is a preview on YouTube that I'll link to it in the description below so you can go and be inspired by Norman Kennedy uh, because he is just a fantastic resource for all things um, fiber related from old knowledge. And what I learned from that DVD was how to spin in the old way. And he's speaking from a uh, Scotland from a, from the Scottish perspective uh, primarily, but he does go into some techniques from further afield. Um, but what I mean by the spinning in the old way is that today most of us who spin do so because, as a hobby, because we enjoy it, because we like it, maybe because we want to make something out of the yarn that we spin, but we, we do it for pleasure rather than for practicality. And before the Industrial Revolution, every bit of textile that was produced in the world was done with hand spinning. All the threads, all the yarn, all the, the cloth was made from hand spun yarn. And that connection to the past, I think, is really, really interesting to me. But... If you were spinning out of necessity, you do so in such a way that you don't take all the time to be precious with, you know, making sure all the fibers are lined up perfectly. You do fiber prep, but you do it as economically with your time and your energy as possible. And unfortunately, I think a lot of those techniques are lost to us or we're having to rediscover them because of the um, generational gap from not learning how to spin from, you know, our, our ancestors' knees. Uh, and that really changed fundamentally how I think about spinning. And now I'm constantly thinking about, is this, am I sitting in the way that would have been done? Is this posture relaxed enough so that I could sit here and produce a lot of yarn? Um, can, it, is there a way that I could do this more efficiently? Um, was there a way that I could sit or hold my hands or um, any number of things, prepare my fiber so that it's more efficient um, and closer to how it would have been done in the past when people were spinning for, out of necessity? That concept now runs through every everything that I do in terms of spinning. The second thing that blew my mind from this DVD, but also um, uh, there is a YouTube video, and I'm going to butcher her name, Kathleen. Uh, oh, I'll put it down in the description below, a link to the video. Um, Kathleen Air... I, anyway, I, I can't remember the name, but I will definitely get it to you. Um, was the concept of grasp, 
grasped, as in grasping in your hand, spindle spinning. So rather than what I thought of as drop spinning, or now I know it's called suspended spindling, um, where you have the hook, as I showed, um, the hook on, on the end that you do a half hitch of your yarn around as you're doing the spinning, and then you let the spindle descend to the floor, um, which I always did standing up because you wanted to have the maximum length that you could spin before winding it on and starting it again. Um, spinning standing up is tiring. And I always got tired of standing long before I got tired of spinning. With grasped spinning, I can sit on the sofa, I can walk around and do things, but essentially the, the spindle never leaves my hand. And the spindle is not being suspended, the weight of it is not being suspended by the um, fiber as I'm spinning it. So it really changed um, fundamentally how I do spindle spinning and I now never use never I rarely use a uh, spindle with a hook I prefer a pointed spindle I just let the yarn twist up the shaft of the spindle and then uh, flick off the tip which is more similar to um, spinning on a great wheel spindle if you've ever done that but it's also amazingly faster than spinning in the suspended style. I don't know how much of that is because I'm not doing the half hitch and undoing the half hitch every time I want to wind on to the spindle, or if there's something else about it that is, um, you know, it doesn't take as much of my brain to make sure that the spindle is um, still spinning and not bumping into the floor and all of those sorts of things. Uh, but I can sit on the couch and spin with the spindle and it's, I get a lot done quickly. Um, so if you haven't tried grasped spinning um, with a spindle, I highly recommend it. It changed my spinning life.
That's it for this video. Thank you so much for spending some of your creative time with me. I hope to see you in the next one. Bye!